I guess that's, that's the other thing is that I'm in the UK, you're in Australia. This is like, this is the worst possible distance to be covering. Yeah, like if I, if I was to point, point to you, I have to point <laughs> Damn. that way. You're like, exactly. <laughs> I don't go that way, I don't go that way. Yeah. So yeah, welcome to a very strange new interview format for Thinky Games, uh, where I'm going to be playing a game while the developer watches me and judges me and hopefully tells me about the process of developing the game. Uh, and today we're playing this lovely game. Um, ben, would you like to introduce yourself and the game to us? Yeah, well, it's a, like you say, it's a strange interview of a strange game with a strange person. <laughs> being me. Uh, my name is Ben Taylor. I'm the sole developer of Can of Wormholes, and this is my first major release on Steam. Well, that is, that's, that's also like really impressive. First major release, and this has immediately become like a puzzle game fan favorite. Yeah, I am. I was blown away with the response, to be honest. I was super nervous hitting that release button on Steam because yeah. I just didn't know what to expect. So we interviewed you before for that written interview, um, and you spoke a little bit yes. about like you were, you know, you were experimenting with snake mechanics. I'm kind of curious to hear a bit more about that, like origin story of what you were doing at the time you came up with this game. Yeah, it's. I just, I always wanted to make a puzzle game, and I just had the idea of something like the old school snake on like the Nokia mobile phone, where you just eat the pellet and you grow longer. And I know Snake Bird had done something similar, and I enjoyed that game, but. It was something about the ability to move backwards, which just seemed to open up this new whole world of possibilities. Like you could still use you know, your four cardinal inputs, up, down, left, and right, but there was always the question is what happens if you press the direction that goes back towards your body? Like, does the whole like worm or snake jump back, or do you reverse in some way? And just uh, figuring out how to actually navigate the world in itself kind of just became its own puzzle. Like taking everything else out of the game, just putting the worm itself on a platform, it became interesting just navigating that space and trying to figure out how to actually reverse yourself in certain ways. So that was the whole seed of the idea there. So it just started off with the like navigational aspects of, of yeah of, the, of moving and around then... the snake, and somehow somehow it ended up with this where I'm rolling around <laughs> <laughs> as a tin can. Uh... We ended up with oh, actually, I've, I've brought a visual aid here. This was something made by a couple of friends of mine, and they gave it to me on the day of release as a surprise. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, it's a tin can. It was originally filled with spaghetti, I believe, but thankfully they ate all the spaghetti and then filled it up with candy, so that was okay. So yeah, it, the game somehow yeah, evolved from the the pure puzzles, the, the worm-based puzzles, which was the whole game for a long, long time. But um, I got interested in the whole like metagame aspect and how to... to pull it all together. Um, I was tempted to do just the level select for a long time, where you select level 1, select level 2, but um, without getting too deep into spoilers, there's certain mechanics in the game uh, revolving around how you start the levels, that I thought there was some interesting space to explore there, and I could only right. really do that by having a world that existed outside of the levels. So that's actually so, one of the things I was going to ask about, is like, how did you come to the decision uh, Oh yeah, okay, look, go forward a little bit. Um, how did you come to the decision um, for the like the world around the levels to be a kind of free roaming type of... Because like a lot of puzzle games have a meta aspect to them and usually, well, like a kind of level select. It's, it's either like you're picking levels from a menu or like the common thing is to just have the same mechanics as the puzzles outside. Like what led you to yeah. like, having a separate... Like a Steven form? Sausage Roll style thing where it's a... a just a bigger version of the levels themselves, yeah. Whereas Absolutely. in my game, it's it's different controls, it plays differently. I kind of wanted something that was just a break from the puzzling. Like, uh, I love puzzle games, but I also love action-y games. And even though this isn't an action game, I just like that you can like wiggle the inputs backwards and forwards to shape the can, or just spam <laughs> rings everywhere. Right, it's, it's kind of just, it's almost just a release in between puzzles. Yeah. Like it's, you don't want to leave the puzzle and then just be trapped in this puzzle-only world, um, even though there are a couple of puzzles in the overworld. But for the most part, it is 
just a glorified menu where you can just chill out for a bit. Because uh, a lot of a lot of um, puzzle games, I think for a lot of people, they'll end up, especially grid-based games, will end up feeling a bit like uncomfortable or like like not very freeing. And it's like it is noticeable that when you play this game, between the puzzles, you've you've got a bit more freedom. You can just roam around and shoot the rings everywhere or whatever. Uh, and it just yeah, it does it does make it feel a bit more open and freeing. I think. I'm just going ahead with the rest of this. <laughs> Oh, this, this this entire intro section is just on autopilot in my brain. I've done it so many times. So it's, it wasn't even registering, to be honest. Like, it's just, I could be doing this with my, my eyes shut. Um, right, so I think one of the things you one of the things you mentioned in the, the written interview that we did before was that it sounds like the can became part of the game after figuring out the pun, like, can of wormholes. Is that right? Is, it, is that the order that things happen? Yeah, so I originally had a character that was just the ring so it was just a circle character that was the mouth it had a couple little eye stalks poking out the top and two legs and it would just waddle around and kind of just face plant onto the interfaces where you started the levels but i kind of wanted something that was separate from the ring itself to be the thing that started the levels like some kind of container i didn't know what that right. was going to be but at some point in time the phrase can of worms just popped into my head as a saying <laughs> and I decided just to double down and just go completely literal with it and just let's just make it an actual can and, and fill it with wormholes <laughs> and this is what we're talking and, about about being able to like free roam around and just throw rigs everywhere yeah, and just, I, it, just hit that button it's fun as fast to see as you people can. it's fun to see people like start to like try and shoot the rings into the flower parts <laughs> it's just a silly yeah. little thing to do <laughs> actually um if you stay on that screen for a moment, you see that, that bird in the background, which is actually an mm -hmm. Australian magpie. Um, that ah. does tie into the, the plot a bit, so I won't stay specifics, but I did go mm. through my phone earlier today, so this is another visual aid I've got here, but this is a photo I took of a, a magpie that landed on my lap one day at my previous apartment, and I took this photo, and as you can see, it's pretty much just a one-for-one one on the screen there. I, I can't draw, nice. so I, I traced it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's the extent of my artistic capabilities. That's amazing. So you recreated it in the game as part yeah, of the story. Yeah, so hopefully that bird there is still alive somewhere out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so speaking of like, we won't go into details because it's like, it would get fairly spoilery, but it's kind of shocking how elaborate the story gets here or like almost how cohesive it is, given that I'm a tin can walking around on worm legs, solving these puzzles. There's like some kind of cohesive story. I'm kind of curious, was it was that almost a challenge to yourself? Like, it feels like you were, you were like, there's no way there could be a story for this. I'm just going to make a story for this and make it work somehow. Is that how, how did Pretty you approach much. that? First and foremost, I'm not a storyteller, so I, I kind of had to find the story. Um, and on, on that note, like whenever I'm watching a playthrough, of a game like even like this the points where i get most nervous are watching the introduction and the outro because that is just purely story whereas something like this i'm comfortable with i was happy with the puzzles but the story side of things i got close to, to ditching it a couple of times and just going back to the whole simple menu level one level two because i just didn't know if i could tie it all together and i still don't know if i, I managed it but i'm happy to hear you say <laughs> it, it was at least a bit coherent it's not a realistic <laughs> story no 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 uh, but it's and, like but like it all pieces together and you feel like it all makes sense i just realized like, that i am like going to be blasting through these puzzles except i'm not because i'm stopping to talk but like <laughs> uh, uh i guess spoilers for some of the puzzle solutions for anybody who's watching but um yeah here we go <laughs> sorry yeah so the idea in that puzzle that's taught is just you can stay on top of a level as long as a single piece of your body is on top of the level and really i tried to teach exactly one idea per level a couple of times i think i did two and a couple of times i yep. split the idea over two levels but for the most part i can kind of i think of the levels as the idea they teach so yeah this one is you won't fall off the level and you won't lose as long as one part of your body is on top of it because this worm has amazing right so it's shape. basically this behavior here of like if you stick your head or your tail out because like i guess the intuitive thing might be that somehow gravity like it's, this is a very strong worm. It can hold itself 
uh, <laughs> over over the void, I guess, or the background. Um, and that might not be intuitive to people who are picking up the game for the first time. So it's like, this is teaching that yeah. idea. And then taking a step back to the tutorial level that you did in the introduction, that one was purely just, what do I do? Like, the, oh, that's teaching that. You put the worm in the hole. It's not that easy. It does have an insight, though. We haven't talked about insights, but every puzzle has. Uh, yeah, I, uh, its I own... meant to like see the insights. Like, I'm curious about the insight there. Yeah, so there is one actually for the tutorial level. I'm not sure if anyone would have ever used it because um, <laughs> I, I think if you struggle with the, the tutorial level, it's not going to end well. <laughs> right. I'm curious. Uh, I almost want to go back and see it now, but it's too late. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm curious to see what it is. Like, it's got to almost be a joke, right? Like, you just push it yeah. in immediately. <laughs> I'm trying to I remember now that. what That's this fantastic. one is as well. I think it's just two distinct islands that you have we, we to. We take a look and introduce folks to the to the idea of the insights. Um, so, so yeah, so this uh, this is like a feature of this game that people have been really like celebrating and saying like it's i've noticed it affecting new games that people are making at the moment there's like other games are adding yes. a gain insight feature i'm um, very happy to see that um so i guess just for the viewers um the way this works is in the menu there's this gain insight button i guess it's a bit it's a bit like a hint button but rather than your typical style hint you get like another version of the level that's a little simplified. So I'm not sure I've seen this one. This is interesting. So rather than having you go like outside the bounds of the level, you've brought the, the void into the middle of the level. Yeah, you've got no really choice. There's no it. other obstacle apart from the open air Except... between you and the goal. <laughs> Except falling off like I just did. <laughs> yeah. And the only reason I did call it Show Insight is because I think at its core, I made this game for me. And I'm the type of person in a game whether I'm pig-headed or whatever, I just if I see the show hint option, I won't click it because I, I, I don't want to be spoiled kind of thing. So I tried to think of what kind of hint system would I use. Um, so it, it's almost a way of tricking people into clicking it and then hoping when they click on it, not knowing what gain insight is, they see this hint system, but hopefully are happy with it. Like they're not instantly spoiled of the solution, I hope. Um, so you can always back out and it's still interactive. So it's not like it plays it for you. So um, I'm, I'm hoping it finds that middle ground. A really interesting aspect of um, the gain insight thing is that if you if you if you continue to be pick and don't <laughs> and don't use the gain insights, there's it's almost like half the game you don't play. Like there's a there's a whole set of levels that you just don't get to see. Um, yeah, I'm curious how you feel about that. Like you saw you saw my playthrough, so like. How does it feel to have made all that stuff and somebody doesn't necessarily see it? To be honest, I pref prefer someone only use it if they're stuck on a particular level. Like Different people are going to run up against different problems at different stages and, and get stuck in different places. So the insight is for those scenarios. So ideally, you would only see two or three throughout your playthrough on the ones that you are stuck on. In that case, I'm more than happy for people to see them. Um, unlike the main levels of the game, which I could probably draw every single one of them on a piece of paper right now from memory uh, a lot of the insights I've completely forgotten about and to be honest I would probably still want to update some of them in future patches because there's a lot of room to like tidy those up a bit so I'm not as emotionally attached to the the insights as as I am the normal puzzles they're really just there to help people enjoy the game in their own way more ideally. right um so this area that I'm currently in these puzzles that I'm going through this is like really this is that core idea you started with of like backing up a snake and, and dealing with being a snake body effectively. Yes, right? I think there's about three levels which deal with reversing. I think the first one you did is just basically you just walk backwards down a corridor and that's just telling you, oh, yep. you can go backwards. And then the next two introduce the subtleties of it. Okay, which way does the tail go when I press backwards? Okay, it's the direction that the tail's pointing. Um, already, like you, you're not influencing the direction of the tail as such. You're just yep. telling the tail, "Hey, go backwards, no matter which way you're facing." Um, yep. And then I tried to think of a couple of scenarios to put the player in where they're kind of forced to have that realization. That level you just played, I think, was actually one of the trickier ones in the the first world that people get stuck on. It's, yeah, it's interesting because like, because like I've played snake games before, snake puzzle games before, where you have backing up or whatever, but it's still interesting to get used to the, just the, just get used to the movement. Like you come, you come across this level, I guess the people's natural instinct is to be like, 
oh, but how do I bend my tail around? Like, that's the thing you get stuck on is thinking like, oh, I need to somehow make my tail at, from this point somehow go to the side. But yeah. it's actually about like, wh where does the tail need to be before you get to that point? <laughs> Yeah, it's purely a navigational challenge and like if i look at this mm -hmm. level now and, and yourself looking at this it's almost like it's not a puzzle it's just oh i just go to the goal it's not a challenge but of course when you haven't internalized that that move set and the behavior it is a challenge so one thing i wanted to ask about the insights so we're looking at another one here um, and you can see how this like this forces you into the 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 position you need to be in in order to put your tail out backwards and then curve around and fall into the hole um i'm curious you could be tempted to see it as because there's, there's a kind of philosophy in puzzle design of like a you know a puzzle should be should have like an idea and it shouldn't add extra fluff to that idea it should just be about that idea and only about that idea and it's it's, it's almost tempting to see the or tempting to say that like the insight puzzle is the most pure form of each of these puzzles, right? And and the, the one outside is like almost it's hiding the inside. But is it purely hiding? I'm curious how you think about that. Like, do you think it is you're just yeah. hiding the inside, or is there something more to it than that? It's I think the insights kind of take you by the hand and almost force you into it. Whereas um, the core puzzle, I think, asks you to well, ask yourself the question like what would happen like if it's like it doesn't put you in that immediate position it's like okay i need to go there can i like, engineer a situation to to experiment with the rule set so it's, it's always just out of reach like it's always one or two moves that you have to do to allow that discovery to happen and i think it's more rewarding if the player has to take those steps themselves rather than being forced into the situation where the, the discovery is just given to them um, but at the same time if you're not having that discovery then I think it's nice to have that option there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And like, I think one of the things you've done well is the, like, because in a sense it is like you're you're obscuring the the insight in some way, of course, because you want people to come to that insight themselves. But it's not a case of just like hiding it with pure like obfuscation. It's it's like there's a way to figure out that you need to have that insight, right? There's a there's like a logical sequence of steps that you can go through to get to that insight. Yeah, and trying to remove all other possibilities from the picture. So that looking at this puzzle here, there's a tiny little corridor mm -hmm. that you can move in. Um, and you've only got yeah. a few options of what you can really do. You can you can back out the long way that you came in, and you just end up on the floor. Yep. Uh, you can go out forwards yep. down the bottom and try and reach mm -hmm. around to the entrance. And I think you're one unit too short and can't quite do it. So then, <laughs> Yeah, that's sneaky. <laughs> and then some people think you have to turn around and go out forwards to the left. Um, Mm. but that's oh, not yeah, quite like, possible. You, you can oh. turn around and back your tail down the right of the screen, but you can't quite get your head oh, into the puzzle. But that still requires you to experiment a bit with the reversing. So you're, you're always going along the right path, but it's kind of putting up a wall at the, the last moment there. But the hope is you haven't invested an hour of your time chasing the wrong solution and the game hasn't let you do that. There's a couple of puzzles where it does let you do that and I'm, <laughs> I've had to change them. Um, but for mm -hmm. the most part, I've tried to keep the, the walls just close enough to allow that little bit of freedom, but still uh, still be guiding you invisibly. Right. I remember this was the first puzzle that I got like truly stuck on and it's not, it's, it's not that complicated compared to some of the later puzzles in the game. <laughs> I think it is just like yeah. getting, getting used to the movement at the beginning is just a th thing you have to go through so like there's a version of this game where you could have just not tutorialized the snake movement at all and been like uh oh, you can figure out the snake movement while figuring out all the other stuff that, that's in the game um but i think it's really good that you do have these puzzles because even though like this ends up being like kind of complicated like you think it's this really small space there's not that many options but you could keep going around and you're like oh, no there's, there's no way of turning around in this space i can't do that and then back up there's so many like possible ways to get stuck um but like i think going through those and getting stuck in all those positions really like um really gets you to realize like how how the snake movement works so that in the later puzzles you just fully understand it yeah this game is all about like trying to find those subtle little interactions and and making a puzzle out of it where possible because i think even from the very first tutorial level technically every like puzzle element that you encounter throughout the whole game is in that level 
Uh, you've got the circuit that connects to the start of the worm, you've got worms themselves, you've got fences and you've got walls, and you've got the goal that you go into. And beyond that, nothing's ever added. So the only ideas that we can explore and teach in levels are ideas like what happens when you reverse or what happens if you put yourself in this specific situation. And that's kind of where the name of the game fits in as well, I think, because it kind of is a bottomless can of worms of like how far these interactions go. I hope like people are like constantly surprised by the interactions that keep popping up. I mean, that is definitely a feature of this game is like, <laughs> like every few puzzles you're like, oh my gosh, I can do this. <laughs> uh, or like you can build a puzzle out of this. And I think critically, you could always do that. Like if the elements in the puzzle allowed you to do so or were in the right configuration, like the elements were always there, but perhaps not in the right arrangement to let you do that thing. This this one feels like a like a different format in a sense. In that it's like it's almost like a little bit of a math puzzle or something. Do you see it that way? Or in your head, what is the like? What's the thing here? Yeah, this, this level changed quite late because I did have. A more complex puzzle that required going over pits and backing mm -hmm. into certain corridors and whatnot but i just wanted to keep it about yeah. the food and it's like well up until this point your worm's always been the exact size of the hole so maybe it's not even obvious that you have to fill the entire thing to complete the level so um you might just eat one of the foods and go ah, in the hole and I realize see. you failed so it's about you have to eat the exact amount without going over <laughs> it's also like one of the levels I like to think of as a like a playpen level so if you if you have an idea later in the game and you want to experiment with some ideas or interactions or even some later mechanics that you might discover it's one of those levels that kind of just gives you a, an open space and some things to play with to to experiment with really that you can go back to I just want to point out like this is an example of how like playful you are with the like the well I guess with the whole game but also the world around the puzzles is like things like this so he's like oh in this case it's in the middle of the thing so you've got to realize that you need to like you've, you've also found like little insights to have about throwing wormholes around <laughs> and there was a lot more originally actually I had quite a few overworld like physics gimmicky puzzles and I ended up cutting a whole lot of them because they were a bit right. too finicky, um, like trying to bounce the can off certain angles and, and like thread the needle through certain gaps, and it became a bit like twitchy. Like, and this isn't a, that type of game. I love those types of games, but this isn't one of those. This is a game where you can press one key at a time, um, yeah. take your time, and you, and you get the desired result. And those puzzles just weren't that. So I, there are still overworld puzzles in the game, as you know, but I really had to dial them back. Uh, I can't. I need to actually think about this one because <laughs> uh, it's. Is it just a case of doing that, or do I need to <laughs> first extend? We've uh, hit our first wall. Oh no! It's happened. <laughs> Maybe I've already finished the game. Yeah, I've I've seen you do this level before. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> this could have almost been two puzzles. This level because we were talking before about y your head replacing the the tile that your tail's on, but. There is another step to it where it's very important which order you eat those pellets in. Yeah, and you do have to eat that first one, allowing you to reverse out. I'm seeing what the thing is. Okay, so, okay, there's the inside. Yes, sneaky. So you have to go up. Oh, but no, no, no. Okay, oh, I see. You So there's an extra layer. That's, oh, it's, it's evil. Um, so first you do that so that you can back out. Then you go. Yeah, I kind of thought one. of this as like a almost a checkpoint or a skill test puzzle kind of thing, where it just brought mm -hmm. a few concepts together. Um, and it's one of those ones that I imagine people might then go back to. Perhaps it's not strictly required to solve this one to immediately progress. So yeah, absolutely. I like to throw a few trickier ones in early. There's actually so there's something I keep wanting to ask you about that um, it keeps happening and. We're talking about something else and it happens. So I'll just, I'll bring it up now. The piano sounds that play while you're solving a puzzle. Yes. Um, like, so I didn't pay that much attention to it when I was playing. Um, I knew it was there. I knew it was like a nice subtle effect. Um, but then watching another playthrough at the moment, um, that, that, that person has like almost started using it as feedback about like whether they're stuck or not. And so I guess just to elaborate for those who are watching, if you were to push that pellet onto the floor, I would think I think you'd get one. Um, if I push this down, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So there isn't actually a lot of smarts going on with those uh, piano hits. There is with the chime yeah. um, 
that plays as you're about to complete the level and when you get stuck. But for those mm -hmm. other highlights, there's just kind of a cooldown going on. So certain events will trigger it if it hasn't happened within a certain amount of time before. But I think it has been misleading for some people. Because they, they may think it's telling them they're on the right track when really it's just they've done something a bit fancy. <laughs> and <laughs> whether or not it's, it's contributed to finishing the puzzle. So I guess that's for the sounds that are like, there's like the happy sounds, the, the, the little jingles. Um, but then there is the, the error sounds that happen. In fact, I think we just got one yes, there. Yes, you've got one there, yeah. yeah so there. that, there is some smarts behind that. The game's always looking, it's either three or four steps into the future, and it's just exploring that full possibility space of all the directional input combinations. And if it does that full search and yep. there's no outs, like it, it's, it's stuck, then you'll get that, that prompt. I think in the first world as well, it will it'll throw up the undo restart prompt, and then I I think I suppress that from world two onwards because um, it becomes a bit much. But then I realised when I did that, I got for free uh, an extra feature was, which when you're approaching the end of the level and you're a few steps away like that, the music can start playing ahead of time. So I'm already doing that search. So if I happen to stumble upon the solution to the puzzle, I figured why not just start playing the chime early. <laughs> Yeah, so it'll play the, the first half of the, the completion chime, and then the, the rest of it will play once you actually finish the level. So it can kind right. of leave you hanging if you get close to the end of the level and then back away. <laughs> yeah, I'm just hovering over the piano. I'm not, I don't quite press those last keys. Like, so I, I'm skipping ahead of a puzzle here, but just to show this kind of like animation, I'm kind of really impressed with the level of detail in there's things like the like the the way the can opens when you approach the door and the things come out. It's just what it is is the the fact that you've decided to put all that in. But you could have just had a count of how many of the little symbols you've collected. Um, yeah. And the door opens. I'm curious, like, what was your your approach to when you? It's, it's I guess it's like adding like juice to the game, but like what was. But but not the typical like screen shake or whatever. It's like something else. What's your approach to, to deciding when to do that kind of thing? I think a lot of that came from the fact I wrote the game engine itself because I've experimented, oh, wow. experimented okay. with game engines in the past. <laughs> um, but I'm not using Unity or Unreal or anything for this. So that's why I went down the procedural route because I didn't have those uh, handy tools of importing existing animations and the like. Um, it was just bare metal C++ code a lot of the time. So I didn't really have an animation system to like lean back on. So when it came to things like animating the legs or something, since I had to write the code to, to do the animation system anyway, why not make it like custom tailor made for exactly what I wanted to do rather than just playing some stock animation. And that's the, the part right. of computer graphics I, I like anyway, having things that are kind of procedural and, and react to what you're doing rather um, than making something in Blender, which I'm not very good at and just importing the model. I'm a, I'm a glutton for punishment. The only part where that um, came back to bite me was the, uh, it's a bit spoilery, but when you get to the front of the world, that room, <laughs> and, and the interface at the front of each world, um, I kind of wish I'd just imported a mesh for that rather than hand coding it, but almost everything else uh, just made sense to be dynamic, including like the plants. I had previously experimented with like a dynamic plant system. So I already had code like in my back pocket to make like trees and, and cacti and everything. So I just I ended up throwing those in the game. So they're all procedural as well. There's also yeah. no fonts at all in the game for text. Like every bit of text you see is just me writing with my little, um, my, <laughs> my digital light tablet, <laughs> like three <laughs> instances of each piece of text. So, um, if you wanted to commit like identity fraud for me or something, there, there's my handwriting. <laughs> so this is uh, like a texture you've imported into the game. Yeah, and it was my incentive to try and keep text to a minimum. I, I didn't mm. want screens of text. I kind of wanted everything to just be taught naturally. Text was going to be for menus and for very early like prompts for controls or whatnot. You've made it hard to internationalize the text at this point. I have, yeah. So I've actually got, I, um, I was thinking of, for the international versions, then just writing um, a script to generate the images for me. But I thought, nah, I'm going to do it myself. So I've got the simplified Chinese and I've done the French release. Oh. And I've just hand drawn all those as well. Oh, really? Fantastic. I, it's, it's almost therapeutic, I think. Here's, here's another silly little thing you can do in the overworld. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that was the focus of a so... lot of overworld puzzles. And they're all very frustrating. So now it's just like a, 
almost just a mess around mechanic. It does tie in a bit to the story and gameplay. I, I, I think the that thing really pays off when this is definitely getting spoiled, so we're very vague. Um, when you're like unable to do it at a certain point of the game. Yeah, you don't have the oomph to throw the the can very far. So this is this is where we first get our first like branching point. I remember when I was playing this. Um, my, I'll go through. In fact, um, I, like, I think I went straight past and didn't even notice this door. Um, yeah, a lot of people didn't notice it, and that's kind of by design, um, because you've always just been going to the right, um, and it kind of just looks like an open window or something. It it, yeah. it doesn't really call you to it. So I actually do add a hint. If you don't go down there and you complete these next two puzzles, you will yeah. get a hint popping up, and it actually pops it on your map screen saying, "Hey, like go here." And I didn't do that much throughout the game, but I thought. That was one place where I really needed to like hold the player's hand a bit because it wasn't immediately obvious what you actually had to do. Or it's like, oh, have I forgotten to get one of these sigils, perhaps? Although that is a bit of a troll, having um, 12 of the 14 sigils <laughs> required to open that door. Ah, so it's, t it's telling me to look at the map now. Uh, so it's interesting. I remember when I saw this, I was like, oh, I see we've got like a Metroid-style world with like elevators. And what, do you, is that a common uh, interpretation? Yes. Lots of people have referred to that as an elevator, which makes me smile because yeah, I didn't foresee that happening, but it, it makes a lot of sense. And as a fan of Metroid myself, I can totally see it. But of course, that all starts breaking down eventually. I, I think it makes it more fun because you, you have this, you build this model of like, oh, okay, I guess we got in an elevator, we've gone down an elevator. And then when you do realize what the structure of the world is, when it's revealed, like not too far along from here, uh, Suddenly, your like perception of the way the world structures gets completely like uh, restructured, uh, which is a very fun moment. Yeah. Yeah. So here's where we introduce multiple worms into the level. So I, I, I held off until the second world before introducing those. I thought it was a nice um, something distinct, even though, like I say, there's no new puzzle elements themselves in mm. the levels. Um, I hadn't until this point included multiple worms. We've been going through a bunch of levels here and. I believe have any of the ones we've been through but you know there's some of these levels have like things that are kind of hidden in plain sight there's like another layer to this game some of those extra layers are themselves complex interesting puzzles I'm curious did you was it a case of going back through puzzles and finding ways that you could do things differently in them or was it did you have existing puzzles that you adapted to have new solutions in them it was really finding those puzzles that best allowed for uh, alternate solutions to happen without breaking the fundamental idea of it. So because that, that idea that we're hinting at didn't come into development until quite late in the process. Okay. A lot right. of the core ideas were there from the start, but that is one that came up a, a bit later into the piece. So it kind of had to be like shoehorned into the the game in a way and it did require some redesign of levels but for the most part it was reworking levels that did already exist but just lent themselves to to having that but at the same time trying not to let that second layer be discovered too early <laughs> trying to find that balance of like allowing it to happen but keeping it at arm's length <laughs> if possible or not making right. it too obvious that there's something else going on here I asked about the origin story of the game before, but like, what's your background before this? Because, because like a game like this, I usually expect like it to come from somebody I've seen. They've built a bunch of like interesting puzzle script prototypes, or whatever. But with you, I don't think I'm not personally aware of things you've done previously. In puzzle space, I kind of just appeared out of nowhere in a sense. I had previously released some iPhone games. Um, I did a solitaire one. I did uh, one called Juice Belts, which. Uh, wasn't hugely downloaded, but was well received. So that made me think I could tackle the, the puzzle genre. But this right. would be almost 10 years ago, I think I released that game. I do work as a software developer uh, in the non-game space. So that's my primary income. But I've always had that game dev itch in the back of my my head there. Uh, but being in Western Australia, it's, it's, it's not a lot of... Um, opportunity here and I, I kind of like just going at it alone as well so I dedicated a couple of days a week to like working on this project um, it came together over maybe the last two years I'd say I focused on it 
pretty heavily and, and realized I was going to see it through. But it existed in some form as long as probably five or six years ago as one of like many prototypes that I was just messing around with in my spare time. But uh, once I knew I, that I had something and, and, and kind of wanted to see it through to completion, I reckon I spent a good two to three days on it a week for probably a year and a half. Right. Uh, so w were you playing other similar puzzle kinds of puzzle games at the time? Do you remember what you were playing? What was inspiring you? Yes. Uh, huge puzzle game fan. So Steven Sausage Roll, first and foremost, I think, was the, the biggest mm -hmm. inspiration. Something about that, that same thing of very few components and, and elements available to you in the game's world, but somehow you just keep finding other ways that you can piece them together and new interactions kind of just pop out that in like, hindsight it's obvious that they were always there but they just never occurred to you um, and games like Bubba is You uh, The Talos Principle which we mentioned before this is another big one uh, as a witness um, huge fan of so I've, I've always been the puzzle game fan and you mentioned the Cracking the Cryptic video as well that uh, that <laughs> comes from a, a love of like Sudoku and, and uh, what do you call them uh, pencil puzzles so it's I've always been the puzzle game fan and the reaction to my early iPhone game made me think I I could probably make something interesting if I put the time in and thankfully uh, people seem to like it so I was um, working on like a Minecraft style game for a while just really a teaching myself how to do it style experiment just learning games programming and, and just experimenting really and it's something I might revisit right one day but never properly released um so no this is the first pc release um so first steam right. release so i had no idea what to expect i was very very <laughs> nervous hitting that release button because i, I figured i would just hit that button release um and then a week later no one's played it and i'm like oh well <laughs> it was worth a shot kind of thing but <laughs> thankfully the re reaction has been super positive more than i could have possibly imagined and i'm, I'm very thankful for that and people like yourself playing it on, on YouTube as well. Um, I can still, at night, open my phone and watch like, Let's Plays of, of the game, which is insane to me. Yeah, I, I, I love like seeing people play something you, like you've made. Like It's so exciting to see the, the things you've designed for there to be moments of, of uh, surprise and joy and whatever, and to see it happen is like, the best thing. <laughs> this puzzle has a bit of an odd design, actually, because it was... It, it was to teach the idea of the, the ingesting of other worms, probably the most disgusting mechanic in the game. <laughs> but um, I, I didn't know the best way to kind of do it. It's, it's one of those things where I wanted the player to just stumble upon it, but not have it be their intention, which wasn't the intention for most puzzles. Normally, I wanted them to have the idea in advance, think, OK, what happens if I do this, execute the movements, and see if they were right or not. But this puzzle. I kind of just wanted to put them in a state where they weren't quite sure what to do, but give them enough chances to just walk straight into the solution and be like, wait, what just happened kind of thing? So there's actually two spaces in this puzzle where like that moment can happen. There's one in the middle where that food is, and then one on the right-hand side, depending on where you position the, that curve. Oh, board, interesting. Just to try and maximize the chances of that, that thing happening. <laughs> I suppose that's, that's particularly useful when it is a completely new new interaction is like you kind of want to force it because otherwise you're putting people in a position where they're just working with the tools that they've got and they're just like this is impo clearly impossible because I've just got these yeah. tools. So it, it's it's not a, a fair puzzle in the, the strictest sense I think like a lot of the puzzles I think are fair but I, I still like this puzzle and I think it's okay to put a few puzzles in like that where it's it kind of throws a, a curveball at you and you're not even sure what's going on when you start it. It's worth it's worth it for the moment, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. So I had to keep that moment from being discovered in the prior puzzles as well, because the moment you have a a worm in the puzzle that isn't your own worm that you're controlling, and there's a wall or a fence or something you can press up against, then um, there's there's potential for things to happen. <laughs> so, uh, like that puzzle you've got on the screen now, the the bottom right, you, you can't get in a position to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. So you've structured all you've structured all the walls to to prevent it. That's really interesting. They're all facing one way. I'm, I'm curious. Like at the time, did that feel like you were making the puzzle inelegant, or 
like just to, just to avoid this thing happening, or were you happy with that? It did a bit, and in, in later puzzles, you can discover things early, and I think and you did in your yep. playthrough, and a lot of people did. Um, but they always, I think, kind of happen in places where it kind of feels like it's unintended, or at least it should, like that. It's not part of the intended solution. You've gone so far off the beaten path, and then something weird happens. You're like, oh, okay, I've stumbled into this, and it doesn't feel like this is where I'm meant to be going. But in a level this small, I think if I had allowed that mechanic we were hinting at, yep. that you discover a couple puzzles later, yep. you might think it's part of the solution. And I like I, I like to keep that one hidden. <laughs> so that should have been impossible up until now. So as you know, that happened with me where I discovered something earlier. It was like, oh, is this... It, like, it becomes a distraction, right? You, you, you suddenly think like, oh, maybe is this a tool I'm supposed to use in this puzzle? And I think you'll find that puzzle slightly different now if you were to play it again. <laughs> I think I've seen it, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's probably a good good idea to change it. Yeah, so there's a couple of times where uh, Let's Players have almost doubled as um, bonus play testers for things that I, I've missed. And I've made <laughs> cheeky little subtle adjustments. Yeah, so I remember hearing that you, um, in the kind of meta progression of the game, it's possible to accidentally like skip ahead. Have you been adjusting things to avoid that, or do you just accept that that's probably inevitable? I've, I've made it a bit harder to do, I mm. think. I've, um, uh, it, it, it's harder to discover that location than it was originally, but still far from impossible. And I was toying with another idea that I could do to, to make it even a, a bit harder still, but I think I've struck the right balance now. And you'll notice I've added level numbers in now as well when you start the level, which wasn't in the game, yep. I think, when you first played it. And it tells you both the, the number of the world that you're in and the puzzle number. Yep. Um, that was mainly to address that as well. So if people see that, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm, I'm much further down the path now than I, I thought I was, uh, they at least have the knowledge that they're in the future and people can rewind. But if they want to keep playing from that point anyway, they're more than welcome to do so. It's um, it's, it's really just making sure they don't think that it's the intended path. One thing I didn't notice is whether the first, the very first level before we got in that rocket, did that have the number pop up? It doesn't uh, when you first enter the level. I can't remember if I suppressed it or not on the pause menu, but mm. no, I, I made a, a point to, to hide that. Because if you see um, the number, you'll be like, hang on, <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah, which yeah, which could be... For those that press the pause menu, and may, if it is on the pause menu, for those that see that, it might be quite an intriguing thing. Like, ah, oh, this is strange. Why would I be... <laughs> yeah, or well, they might be like, oh, why am I playing this game if the guy that made it can't count? <laughs> exactly. Like, uh, how, how, how can I trust him to make... Uh, what have, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> I know you do, you do have a level answer for this, right? It's not in the game, or it's it's packaged with. Uh, yeah, how's that work? There, there is a build of it in the the current version you'd be playing at the moment, but there is a more up to date version on an alternate beta branch, and anyone can switch over to that branch. But I don't yet advertise it because the base game I haven't fully tested uh, to the amount I would like. And the reason I say that is the level editor isn't just allowing you to create your own levels and worlds but i'm actually adding some new interactions and content that you can do uh in these custom levels so it's it's taking it a step further um and that of course has the potential to to break existing content in the game so i'm, I'm very cautious when I, I i push that but um anyone's welcome to switch to the to beta version and have a play around with that uh, it will be properly announced and released when it's done and fully tested and the the aim is to integrate it into Steam Workshop. Um, currently, I've got people on Discord just sending files around manually to each other. I was wondering if you've seen some levels that have uh, kind of surprised you in like what was possible with this game. I have, yes. There's been some very good I ideas. Um, I found out I'm very bad at this game. <laughs> like, <laughs> I I've never had to play it before, if that makes sense. I, of course, I know the solution to every puzzle, so I've, I've never stared at the screen and not known what to do. <laughs> because that would be a memory problem, not a... Not a problem-solving problem. Yeah. So it's a weird experience to play your own game and not know what to do and be surprised by it. Do you, do you find the people who are making custom levels... I, I, I think I remember hearing about this with Babri's U, which has like quite a, um, a large uh, like custom level community. Um, 
is that often people will explore things that you wouldn't explore because they're maybe at the like the edge cases of how interactions work. Have you have you had puzzles like that? The um, like that it probably interesting, but you would never put them in the game yourself. <laughs> yes, exactly that. Like things that puzzles that almost aren't fair in a good way, but unfair by design. Like people that are seeking out that additional uh, layer of challenge. Like they can play puzzles like this made by people that like to, to torture the poor players. And there's some good puzzles that are super, super hard in the, the custom level community. But I wouldn't have included puzzles like that in the base right. game because even though I think this is a hard game, um, it's definitely a tricky puzzle game. I think it's fair for the most part. Um, and I think most players, if they're interested in the core concept, can get to the end. Whereas um, some of these custom levels, as much as I love them, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think people would be getting to the end of them. For now, is that your your main focus? Like just work, like continuing to work on this and get that integration done? Or do you have other projects lined up? I do have another project which I haven't announced yet. That one isn't a puzzle game, okay. but... Um, that's a, a major one I'm looking at, but I do have another idea for a, a smaller scale puzzle game as well that I'd like to release at some point and, um, and keep that within the Thinky Games community as well. That's been a, a great community. I've, I've picked up a lot of testers from him there as well. Um, I think it was Alan Hazelden that originally introduced me to it and I, I thankfully did because it's been a, a great community for that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I would have had the success of release that I did or would have been um, inspired to do another game had I not found that community as well because it um yeah I heard of the game through people posting it to a discord um I think like Corey Martin was um excited about it as well uh, that's actually there's, there's a connection there like the, we haven't seen it here but like there's rotation in this game and he's made games with rotation in I can never remember if it's push pipe paradise or pipe, pipe push, push paradise. paradise it always reverses in my brain but Pipe Push Paradise. Uh, I love that game as well, and yes, yeah, so definitely direct inspiration from yeah. that. And Corey was a, a big help throughout development as well. Not just the puzzles, but um, some music feedback as well. Oh, right, yes. <clears throat> yeah, you both did the music for your own games. Yeah, which was a, a learning experience for sure. <laughs> so I'm surprised, like, if, when, I, when I play Corey's games with rotation in them, I'm like, I'm never making a game with rotation in them. You were like... I'm going to make another game with rotation in them. <laughs> like, rotation's a scary thing to explore. It just tickled my brain the right way. I, I tried to limit it in a, in a sense. Like, um, you, you don't have full freedom of rotation. To get into a position where you, you can rotate is, requires a bit of setup, which uh, I think limits that state space a bit. But there are levels where you have a lot of freedom in which way you can rotate and... Uh, I think that could be a turn off to some people because I know um, as soon as intro uh, sorry as soon as rotations are introduced into games, um, it, it can be quite divisive. Yeah, but I think the people that like them really like them. There's something fundamentally uh, awkward about putting rotations on a grid because, <laughs> like, I think the one of the things you did to avoid problems is that you're rarely rotating. Rarely slash never. I'll leave it ambiguous. Uh, when you rarely rotating to like nudge something that's like on a different plane to the thing that's rotating. Um, whereas like in other games, like with rotation in them, sometimes you're nudging something that's like like not on the same axis as the pivot point, and that just leads to weird cases of like, what would this even do if it was pushing something? Yeah, you're not exactly sure how long a certain part of the worm's going to be if it's if it's falling off the perfect grid alignment as it's part way through the rotation yeah. it's it's hard to just pass what you're seeing yeah. whereas for the most part this is a, a 2d game where you could draw the levels on graph paper and then just flip the rotations in 2d space so yeah you can you can kind of visualize it ahead of time that said custom levels <laughs> <laughs> the custom levels do go there <laughs> Um, okay, so I just want to wrap things up with one final question, which is, are you playing any puzzle games at the moment? Uh, or any puzzle games from like the last year or so that you played? That, they don't have to be released in the last year, but games that you've played that you would recommend? Yeah, um, I'm 
going back to I, I, this game I got about halfway through and I've just returned to it in the last few days uh, called An Architect's Expedition and I think that is a quality quality um, soccer band style game uh, it's very very tight puzzle design I think I can see a lot of Steven Sausage Roll style influence there um, that's that's scratching my puzzle itch the right way this one I, I've just played through Pikmin 4 actually that's a, not the normal puzzle release style game but I'm a big fan of the Pikmin series so there's puzzle elements to that I'm a big fan of that mm -hmm. game um, I was just standing up because I just realized I'm wearing this shirt and this is another one um, Tunic oh Tunic. Again, yes not a puzzle focused game but there are elements to it I didn't even notice I was wearing this shirt actually I was just adjusting my seat and looked down and yeah. saw it and and the answer came right to me it's, um, <laughs> I think that was last year now actually but that, that's a good one the case of the golden idol i think it was that's not normally my type of game like a a story driven puzzle game but i just thought that was fantastic just the way it was put together and um how you could piece the story together by interacting in a, in a very simple way but it allowed you just to kind of to get inside the designer's mind mm -hmm. and, and poke and prod that that tickled my brain the right way as well so that's a fantastic game and then in terms of the future the telus principle too cannot wait Oh, and uh, probably one of my favourite games of all time, um, Outer Wilds, I think, is criminally underplayed. Yep. I think uh, that's one I can just keep watching Let's Plays of because it's it's one of those games you can only play once, really. Yeah, you have um, to live vicariously through others. What's the term I heard? What do they call it? Metroid, Metroid Brainia, which I quite like because you're not gaining skills uh, that unlock in the game. You're just learning knowledge that helps you progress throughout the game and of course once you have that knowledge you can go to the menu option and hit like erase save or whatever but you've still got that knowledge so i mean i guess that's it thank you ben for joining uh it was great to chat there's probably so much more we could talk about with this game but <laughs> we'll have to end it there thank you i'm happy to do it again thanks very much for having me and thanks for all the exposure as well it's appreciated